Welcome everybody to the five big ideas and in inequality uh, speaker series. My name is David Deming. I'll be hosting this first series. A um, couple of notes on the format before we dive right in. Um, so this is uh, quick big ideas from six scholars representing a variety of disciplinary and topical perspectives. Each of the speakers will spend a couple of seconds at the beginning just introducing themselves to you. And then we'll talk for seven to eight minutes um, in rapid succession. And then we will have time about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A for all of the speakers. Uh, just to remind you, this is the first session. Um, this is October 26th. We've got other sessions coming up on November 2nd, uh, November 9th, November 16th, November 23rd, November 30th, and December 7th. So this is an exciting new lineup of quick big ideas, give you an exposure to the, the wild world of the study of inequality and social policy um, here at the Kennedy School and around the globe. Um, all right, so without further ado, why don't I uh, kick us off here? So um, my big idea, so I'm, I'm an economist. Um, I'm a professor at the Kennedy School and the director of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy at HKS, um, under which the uh, Inequality and Social Policy program kind of sits, bureaucratically speaking anyway. Um, and uh, what I work on is kind of education, skills, technology, future of work type questions. And so what I wanna argue today, I think hopefully somewhat provocatively, is that to fight inequality, we should fix the US higher education system. And my argument proceeds in roughly three parts. And I'm gonna be very brief about all three of the parts given the time, but I've, there's a lot more, more where that came from if you're interested to know how I'm backing up the things I'm saying. So the first part of the argument is that growings, growing earnings inequality in the US, but also around the world over the last, let's say several decades, 30 to 40 years is um, explained not only, but um, fundamentally or primarily by differences in the returns to education at different levels. Okay, so when you wanna understand why is economic inequality increased, you cannot explain that without thinking about the growing return to education, in particular bachelor's degree and advanced degrees. Second, um, one thing you often hear people say is that the reason why that's true is that um, there are vast inequalities in academic preparation such that only so many people are quote unquote college material. And I wanna show you that basically that's not true. That actually, if you look at achievement inequality by age 17, just before college, it's flat over the same period and probably even falling, depending on how you measure it. And so that says, well, if, if inequality doesn't look like it's increased um, by age 17, and yet we think um, achievement is in some way related to later earnings, it might suggest that maybe inequality opens up in the college years. And I want to try to convince you in the short time we have that that is true, that um, for two kind of things, one is resource inequality in terms of just dollars spent is far, far, far greater in higher ed than it is in K through 12. That's partly because of the market structure of higher education, but it's also because of um, intentional policy choices we've made in this country over the last 50 years or so. And then second, I wanna talk a little bit about the other sort of resources, which is peers, that um, higher education is highly unequal and highly stratified, much more so than K through 12. And then I wanna just say briefly what I think we should do about it. Okay, so this is a figure from a paper by David Otter showing basically trends in earnings inequality um, over the last 50 years. The chart is showing relative to 1963. So you interpret a number like 1.6 as saying for that group, earnings are about 60% higher after adjusting for inflation. In let's say, if you look at the left-hand figure um, for people with greater than a bachelor's degree, men, earnings inequality in 1996 is about 60% greater, sorry, earnings levels are about 60% higher in 1996 than they were in 1963. Right? And so the way you should think about this figure as the widening rungs of the ladder of inequality by educational attainment. So if you look at men, for example, men with um, a high school degree or less have had basically no progress in terms of inflation adjusted earnings over the last 50 years. And in some cases have even declined slightly. Whereas men with bachelor's degrees and above have really been doing much better. That's also true for women. Uh, for women, it's more of a rising tide that lifts all boats because of um, huge increases in female labor force participation and sort of emancipation of women into the labor market more generally, which is a good story overall, but you still see the widening rungs of the ladder for women as well. And so when you look at patterns of fanning out of the wage distribution in the US, um, that's really fundamentally linked to differences in re um, economic returns by education level. Okay. Um, and there's lots of other ways to slice and dice this data, but that basic story stays the same, however you look at it. So then if you look at um, achievement level in the US, this is um, data from um, a test called the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is, um, it's called a long-term National Assessment of Educational Progress because it's basically the same test given to a representative sample of children in the US over the last um, 30 years, 40 years almost, 40 years. Um, and if you look, this is just showing you the distribution of math test scores at age 17 
at different parts of, of the distribution. So for the 10th percentile of students scoring this test, they scored it about a 254 on this test, which I know doesn't mean a lot to you, in 1978. But that number at the 10th percentile increased to 266 by the most recent year, 2012. Right? And so what you see is at the bottom, test scores have gone up. And again, this is the same test, same scale. So they've gone up by 12 points at the bottom since 1978. If you look at the top, the 90th percentile, it's basically flat. Um, and that's also true of the 70th percentile. So what you see is there's been a small increase in mean achievement among age 17, uh, people age 17 in the US, but that's all happened because of gains at the bottom, not at the top. Um, and this holds for reading. It holds actually even more so this compression of the distribution at age 13 and age nine. Um, and it also, um, you, you see some narrowing of gaps when you look at things like um, the black white test score gap or the Hispanic white test score gap or differences in mean test scores by levels of parental education, they're all narrowing rather than widening or staying flat, okay? So if you have this story that you think, you know, this is all about early access to resources and, you know, what's happening in third grade or fourth grade or ninth grade, it doesn't really look like achievement inequality is expanding. So one reason for that is actually um, right around the in, in the 1990s um, and in earlier as well, there were a series of reforms to the way schools are financed such that in many states, um, they redistribute property tax revenues, which are local, and give them to poor districts um, and take them more from rich districts. So if you're a fancy school district that has a high property tax base, it's easy to raise money to fund your schools. And so states will typically tax them at a higher rate and redistribute some of that money to poorer schools. And that makes resource allocation actually fairly equal in K through 12 at this point. Poor schools are spending about the same per student on average in the US as rich schools are. That is not true at all in higher education. This is just showing you some basic figures of per student spending um, by different research, you know, research universities versus masters versus bachelors versus community colleges. And what you see is just this incredible fanning out of spending. At, at a school like Harvard, we're spending about $100,000 per student per year on an education. If you attend a community college, as you see in this figure, you're getting something like $12,000 per year uh, per student. And of course, many people don't go to college at all and they're getting zero. And so if you think about um, access to resources at different levels of the distribution, it's just highly, highly unequal in higher ed and much more equal in K through 12. Um, and that's partly, um, that, that's maybe even mostly due to policy choices we've made. The other way to look at this is to look at um, across the distribution of all US colleges, where are people going? What is the income distribution of people who are attending and how well are they doing um, when they graduate? And this is from some wonderful work um, by Raj Chetty uh, and co-authors um, looking at the distribution of family income and child's income in all US colleges. And what they're showing on this figure is on the vertical axis, this is the share of all kids who attend a college who come from the bottom 20% of the income distribution and then themselves make it to the top of the income distribution. So for example, if you look at um, Princeton, which is this blue dot kind of at the top left, about 65% of all poor students who attend Princeton themselves make it to the top 20%. So that's an incredibly high mobility rate for students at Princeton. But on the, on the horizontal axis, you're seeing the share of students at Princeton who are actually from the bottom 20%. And that's something like 3%. Okay. And so what that's showing you is for students at the Ivy Plus schools, Princeton, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Columbia, Yale, this, the poor students who attend those schools are doing very well but hardly any of the students at those schools are poor. And so there's just a limited amount that those schools contribute, can contribute to mobility because their student body is overwhelmingly wealthy. And if you look at public flagship schools, they actually don't do that much better in terms of their contribution to economic mobility. Why? Well, because they're actually pretty, um, pretty highly, they're unequal in terms of access, but their success rates are actually a bit lower. So if you look at a school like UNC Chapel Hill, they actually have a very low share of poor students as well, but the share of poor students at UNC Chapel Hill who make it to the top is lower than it is in the Ivy Plus. And so actually on net, public flagships aren't doing any more than um, highly selective private institutions to kind of push the ball forward in terms of economic mobility. Here is the plot for community colleges. Okay, all the community colleges in the country, and here you see the opposite problem. They're actually pretty representative of the income distribution in the US, right? The share of poor kids ought to be around 20% if it's representative and it looks pretty good. Obviously there's variation around this but very few students who attend community colleges themselves get to the top of the income distribution. And so here the problem is different, but no less important. We've got um, a, a very small chance an unacceptably small chance for um, low-income students to do well when they attend schools that are not at the very kind of top of the selectivity distribution. So what do we do about it? My bottom line on this is that I think there's a lot of evidence. Actually, one of the most robust findings in social science is that education pays off 
when you look at um, the causal returns to education, it's large and uh, it's durable across a variety of contexts, different types of schools, different countries, different types of students. So we know that education pays off, um, but the problem is so few people are able to access it and able to afford it. And so education really can be an, an economic equalizer, but right now it only is so for a chosen few. And I, I think that really needs to change. And I think we need to be more ambitious in the way we think about it. So I think there's really two problems we're facing. One is that wealthy students are much more likely to attend the, the most well-resourced, the most selective schools. That's really unfair. It's people who have the most are getting the most in terms of resources. And these schools are supported. All, almost all of them are supported in some way by taxpayers. If you're a nonprofit institution like Harvard, you're tax exempt. If you're a public institution, you're supported directly by taxpayer dollars. So it doesn't quite seem fair that the people who have the most get to access the best resources. But then the second problem is that the colleges that are attended by most people in the US have unacceptably low graduation rates and unacceptably low rates of economic mobility. Right. Even if we tripled the number of poor students in the Ivy Plus schools, it wouldn't make a dent in economic inequality. Why? Because those schools are such a small share of all colleges in the US. If we really want to advance um, economic mobility through education, we need to do it in the schools that 80% of students attend, which is our nation's public colleges and universities. And so there, we really need to improve success rates. We need to get more people through college graduated, and we need to get them access to programs while they're in school that, that lead to economic success. How do we do that? Well, right now, we've made a choice, implicit or explicit, to ration access to college or college quality based on family income. And that's because tuition is very high and only the wealthiest can afford it. And so we have this resource like we call Harvard University. We only have so many seats at Harvard. Uh, Harvard actually you know, is pretty generous in terms of um, giving financial aid to students, but it's not expanding. And so we're only gonna get so many uh, poor students here once we account for legacies and athletes and everybody else. And you know, that's Harvard's problem, but across uh, the country, that's actually not the issue. Actually, financial aid is not generous enough at many selective private institutions so that poor kids who can actually get in on the merits typically can't afford to go. Um, and so I think there's a lot of legal challenges such as, you know, the lawsuit against Yale and what's happening at Harvard. Those challenges are about whether we should ration access to selective colleges based on some criterion other than income, right? And that's a very contentious argument. One way we can get around that argument is to decide not to ration access to college at all. And I know that sounds crazy, but um, we were ambitious once upon a time in this country when it came to the high school graduation rate. There's no law of nature that says everybody in this country should get a free high school education. It's accessible to everyone, it's free. But for some reason, we're gonna stop at college. A hundred years ago, the high school graduation rate in this country was 16.4%. And if you ask people hundred years ago, they would say, there's only so many people who are high school material. We can't afford to expand access to high school. That's just beyond our budget. And yet today, right now, it took hundred years, but our high school graduation rate is right now 90.1%. And so as the knowledge frontier moves outward, we're living longer, work is more knowledge intensive. There's no reason I think why in the long run, we ought not to be pushing toward universal or near universal access to college education. And I think that's what we need to do. So I would call it a Marshall plan for our public colleges and universities. What does that mean? It means dramatically expanding capacity, right? So we need to expand high quality education. UC Berkeley, UCLA, Ohio State, where I attended, they ought to be double, triple in size. Um, all, not, not just those schools, the flagships, but all public universities, they should expand to meet whatever the needs are. And we should end admissions that are based on correlates of wealth, particularly for public universities, schools like the Ivy, Ivy League schools, they're going to do what they want to do. They're nonprofit institutions. They can make their own rules. But at a public school, it's taxpayer funded, taxpayer supported. There's no reason why, in my opinion, a school like Berkeley ought to admit based on correlates of wealth. So we ought to expand capacity. The wealthy can still go, but so can people with low income. That's gonna be expensive and we need to make college free or debt free. That's gonna cost a lot of money. It's gonna be, but it's, I don't think about it as a cost. I think about it as an investment in the future of the economic success of this country. And I think we can do it. So that is my big idea. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks for including me. Um, when Pam invited me to pitch a big idea, um, I decided I wasn't gonna pitch the biggest idea. So I think um, I'd go with what David said. If any of you talk about investing with children, um, I'd prioritize that ahead of what I'm gonna talk about um, also. Um, I thought though that I'd make maybe a marginal contribution by putting an idea that I think is big and has been understudied in economics and underappreciated in policy circles. And that's looking at what's going on with you know, monopolies and concentration in the economy. Um, I got interested in this um, in 2015. I was giving a speech in honor of the 50th anniversary of Joe Stiglitz teaching. Um, my writing with him and, and work with him, it included some things on market concentration and some things on inequality. And I brought them together 
um, in the context of talking um, about that with him. I thought it was important also because if you look at the problems that households face in income, in part it's growing inequality, but in part it's also slower productivity growth. And if you can find any levers that can improve both of those at once, more productivity growth plus less inequality, that's what we should be most excited about. Um, at the margin, this involved thinking about something we hadn't thought about before. And the final thing for those of you on this is issues of monopoly and market concentration had mostly been studied by economists and industrial organization. I'm gonna say something unfair about it by quoting uh, a great IO economist I was on a panel with who said IO economists were like studying a leaf on the end of a tree. People started running through saying the forest was on fire and they looked up at their leaf and said, this leaf looks fine um, to me. So I think getting more people who do um, labor, who do inequality, do other things to think about what's going on on this side of the market is um, quite important. Not just looking at labor markets, not just looking at education, looking at product markets. So let me start the motivation. Um, by talking about something incredibly um, important, at least to some people, um, beer. Um, you have here Budweiser and Heineken. I think most of you recognize um, those two beers. Um, here's a bunch of other beers. Um, Joe, Goose, Elysian. I don't know what any of these are. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about beer. Um, but I know that that group on the left are all made by Anheuser-Busch InBev, and that group on the right is all made by Heineken. And a lot of that reflects mergers over the course of the last few decades that have resulted in the large majority of beer in the United States, even if it's under craft labels, um, being owned by one of these two companies. Um, you see something similar in lots and lots of other industries. You know, there's basically two or three brands of mayonnaise, ketchup, mustard, cat food, fertilizer, ways of connecting to the internet, um, tractors um, and more. Here's a picture from David Leinhart in the New York Times that was nicer than the pictures I had done um, to try to convey the same thing, which show you that the market share of um, the top companies has grown in almost every industry. And you can look at you know, five digit industries and you see the same story for about two thirds of them, the market share of the biggest players um, has grown. Now, whether this is a good or a bad thing is a little bit more subtle than just observing. You can't, the IO people um, are right. You can't just say there's more concentration, therefore there's monopoly power, therefore prices are higher or wages are lower. You have to ask yourself why the concentration um, increase. That concentration is itself um, an endogenous variable. And broadly speaking, um, increased concentration um, could mean one of two things. Um, it could actually mean more competition. Um, I think this is not a bad story for the retail sector. Um, Walmart has grown not because of mergers, it's grown organically, it's opened new stores. Those new stores often brought more competition to local areas. And you actually see in the retail sector um, an increase in efficiency and a reduction um, in markups and you haven't seen um, profit margins growing. In many cases though, um, and I think if you look at the macro data, this is the majority of cases, um, increased concentration means less competition. For example, um, two hospitals merging to one, there the evidence is you get very little improvement in efficiency. You get higher prices, higher markups, and in the case of hospitals, they're mostly nonprofits, so it's not um, a higher profit, but in industries um, more generally, when you see increased concentration, it tends to be not always associated um, with higher profits um, and the like. So you, you it's not just a matter of sort of breaking everything up or having more of everything. It's a matter of getting at the root causes of what's causing um, less competition. Um, there's a lot of things. There's been an exogenous shift towards less merger enforcement, in part because courts have allowed more mergers, in part because um, competition authorities are challenging fewer of them. Um, in some cases, it may actually be more regulations. Um, to open a new hospital, you need a certificate of need. That's a regulatory barrier to entry. Um, in part, it reflects um, 
behavior by companies themselves. There's now an antitrust monopolization case against Google, but the ways in which they've um, entrenched their market power um, with a set of their behavior. All of this adds up to potentially less investment, potentially um, less innovation. So that's less productivity growth and also potentially more inequality through three channels. Um, the first channel is a reduction in the labor share of income, something that I think I saw Anna Stansberry joining this. Um, she has a recent um, excellent paper uh, co-authored on this topic. Um, the second is an increase in inequality within the labor component of income. Um, shifts between capital and labor are part of the inequality story. Most of the increase in inequality though is an increase in inequality within labor income. And a lot of that boils down to increased inequality in wages between companies, um, not within companies, and understanding why some companies become super successful and you get the inter-industry wage differentials that if you are lucky enough to do the same exact job for a profitable company, you get paid more than for an unprofitable company. And then there's been more dispersion in those companies because of the reduction in competition. And then finally, um, uh, Reductions in countervailing power like labor unions are the other half of this. Employers are more concentrated on one end, um, labor unions less on the other. So you look at what's happened to nurses' salaries, for example, the fact that you may not be able to threaten to leave your hospital and go to another hospital to get a raise. You may not actually be able to leave and get that raise because it's all one hospital or because there's two hospitals, but those two hospitals have an easier time colluding when there's only two of them than they had colluding um, when there were five of them, exacerbates that on the one side more power, on the other side um, less. So I would conclude by saying in terms of a lever here, I'm not sure the lever here is as big to pull as a child allowance or a free college um, would be, but I think it's a lever that's been understudied academically because it's been in the hands of IO economists. It needs to at least partly be rescued from them by all of you. And it's been um, a little bit under implemented as a policy that could make a difference for both increasing productivity growth at the same time that it ensures that that productivity growth is better shared. Uh, I'm Jennifer Hochschild. I'm in the government department and Department of African African American Studies at Harvard. I have a what's known as a Schedule C appointment in the Kennedy School and in the School of Education, and I believe there is no such thing as a Schedule A or B. So basically, I have a toehold or a foothold in the in the Kennedy School, which I'm totally delighted about. Um, uh, this is a project that I'm working on with several students who are also in the Inequality and Social Policy program. Um, so. This is a shared enterprise. Uh, and this issue that I wanna talk about is not, this is the end of it, but the beginning of it, um, is the question of intersectionality, which I'm calling, making a plural, intersectionalities and public policies. And the big issue is that we all now agree that intersectionality, which I'll explain in one minute, uh, matters a lot. We have to pay lots of attention to a variety of characteristics of individuals when we think about how inequality emerges and how to resolve issues of inequality. Um, but the big point that I want to make is that that general claim varies enormously when you think about particular public policies and particular ways in which both intersectionality occurs and thereby, to the degree that it's problematic, ought to be resolved or ought to be addressed. So the plural is the central point here. Um, the rough uh, concept of intersectionality is, you know, the Venn diagram. You could add a bunch of circles to this, things having to do with immigration, having to do with age, having to do with disability, having to do with sexual orientation, having to do with a variety of dimensions that themselves may vary depending on your policy arena. The core argument um, was written originally by Kimberly Crenshaw in this famous Stanford Law Review article in the 1990s. As of this morning, it has something over 22,000 citations. Um, so lots of people have used the notion of intersectionality. She focused predominantly on issues of race and gender uh, in the law, but of course, when you get up to 22,000 citations, um, you can use it in a lot of different ways. So I, what I wanna do in my few minutes is just very, very briefly describe four different policy arenas 
Uh, the work that we're doing looks at each of these policy arenas in different cities. So there's huge problems of, you know, too many variables and not enough cases. But that's not an issue for our purposes today. The issue for our purposes today is simply to think about these policy arenas and the way in which intersectionality works very differently in them. Uh, so the first one has to do with police stops. Um, and the big issue here is what we call centripetal intersectionality. Everything converges on a particularly quite precisely identified segment of the population. Uh, and there's two ways in which I'm simply gonna, two very short examples I'm gonna give about this. Uh, one is this uh, stop, question, frisk, SQF, stop and frisk policy in New York City, which started in the early 2000s, rose to hundreds of thousands of stops per year by 2013, 2014, uh, was stopped by a court decision. It has reduced now to relatively few. But over the course of that 20 years, there were about 20, several million um, stops. Um, they were, you won't be astonished to hear, disproportionately young black men in particular neighborhoods. So roughly half of the stops during the period where there were hundreds of thousands of them a year were black men who were about a quarter of the New York population. Uh, about a third of them uh, were in fact Latinos who were about a third of New York City. So that was roughly proportional. About a 10th of the stops were of white men who were about a third of the population. So there's a clear, this is almost entirely gendered. So almost all of the intersectionality in this case was gendered in the sense that it was men. Clear disproportion in racial um, stops. Almost all of these people were between ages of roughly 14 and 34. So there's a kind of 10, 20 year period. So there's a young, there's an age dimension to it. And they were almost all stopped in what the police department called impact zones, which were basically neighborhoods, which were high crime neighborhoods. Now you might think that's an actually efficient thing to do if you think the disproportionate share of the contraband that you're trying to get through a stop question frisk is occurring in these neighborhoods. Uh, and to some degree that was true. This, is, this was not totally mistaken. But in fact, uh, there's lots of evidence, this is a quote from Andy Gelman, who wrote one of the papers, that stops for whites are in the sense are more efficient in the sense that the likelihood of stopping bad behavior or getting contraband from the stop frisking from the frisking was much more efficient for whites. They had a much higher share of those stops produced the outcome that the police were looking for, whereas those for Blacks and Hispanics are much more indiscriminate. Uh, as of yesterday, there was a report in the Los Angeles Times that the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, and it basically the same story, subject to Black and Latino drivers to far more stops uh, than with white drivers, even though they were much less likely to be found with contraband. And the LAPD Inspector General reports that these stops were, quote, of limited effectiveness in identifying evidence of illegal firearms um, and other serious crimes, especially among the young Black and Latino men. So the point is not, that, for me here, is not the issue itself. It's the very tight focus of this kind of public policy. Young Black Latino men in particular neighborhoods. That's what it's all about. Uh, consider then an opposite kind of intersectionality, which we, we're calling centrifugal intersectionality. Our case here is Atlanta, and it has to do with urban development, uh, with the development of the city, the physical development of the city. Um, and again, I tried to think about, I tried to do some pretty graphics here, which my colleagues have demonstrated that I didn't have, and I couldn't do it. I, they were just getting so complicated, it became hopeless. But the basic point here is if you think about urban development, it's centrifugal. It goes in all kinds of directions. There are many, many goals which themselves conflict with each other. There are many, many actors who conflict with each other. There are many strategies within any one of these goals. Do you want to expand transit? Do you want to develop the downtown? Do you want affordable housing? Do you want to develop the Beltline, historic preservation, local empowerment? All of these have different actors, different strategies, different goals. And again, for our purposes here, the most important point is that they have multiple recipients and multiple targets. They tend to be very, very local, at least from the interviews that we did in Atlanta, over and over, people talk about a two or three or four block area. And that's really what they care about when they talk about urban development. So it is intersectional. The residents of Atlanta are disproportionately African-American, disproportionately um, female, disproportionately poor. They live in, of course, a bounded city area, but the targets or the recipients are explode in multiple directions, unlike the, the uh, New York case where it's very clear that there's a particular kind of targeting. Uh, so when you think about intersectionality in Atlanta, you just have to use a different kind of language, a different kind of concept. 
Our third case is Los Angeles. Um, and it has to do with school reform. This is K to 12 schooling. The big issue in Los Angeles, at least when the time that we were doing this had to do with charter schools, but there's a variety of ways that one think, can think about competition over um, school reform. Again, like Atlanta, there were multiple goals, multiple actors, multiple strategies. We could go through the list, but I won't bother you with that here. Um, and what's different about Los Angeles from either New York or Atlanta is that there was, like New York, a fairly tar focused set of recipients or targets, basically public school students who were disproportionately Latinx and poor, um, but a very contested, complicated, layered process of intersectionality in trying to understand how to help those students. So intense competition, especially between the charter schools and the teachers unions, all of whom were working for exactly the same set of students and who saw the other, the other group as the enemy rather than a potential ally or simply a parallel structure. So the intersectionality here focuses on the same set of students, but intense contestation over how to think about that set of students and how to think about the policy reforms. Final case, um, which I will talk about very briefly, uh, has to do with pension funding. I'm one of, as far as I can tell, the two or three political scientists, except for my poor students who actually think about pension funding. Um, but I'm getting totally fascinated with it. Uh, you can start with the fact that the city of Chicago, which is our case, owes somewhere north of $40 billion in public, section, public sector pension funds. Uh, if you look at all states and localities, the number is somewhere between one and four trillion owed into pension funds, depending on how you count. Um, of course, nobody expects all of that to be paid in the next year or even the next decade or the next 20 years, but it's a big pile of money. Um, the estimates are that it would take roughly 6% of city budgets simply to match, to, to maintain the current level of insolvency in city pensions. And it'll take an additional 5% tax raises to get up to some level of plausible solvency, uh, again, over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. So these are huge transfers of income. Uh, when we look at Chicago with the fire at the various unions within the public sector, um, again, we're back on the intersectionality question. Uh, firefighters and police unions are the best funded, they're closest to solvency, and they are most disproportionately white men. Service workers, teachers, municipal funds are, you will not be surprised to hear, less funded, uh, no clear path to solvency, more disproportionately black men and, uh, black men and women. Uh, so there's a, there's a race, gender, age, class disparity within the pension that are and are not being decently funded. None of them are well-funded, but some of them are better than others. Uh, but the, I think the biggest question here is given the huge amounts of transfers that will be necessary even to maintain some minimal level of solvency, never mind to get close to complete funding, uh, it's not very clear who wins and who loses in these cases. Um, and when we did the interviews, people gave us either all kinds of answers or essentially no answer. No, there's no race story here. I refuse to believe that any $4 trillion uh, policy issue that involves states and localities doesn't involve race, class, and gender. It just can't be the case. But when we think about it, it's not clear exactly what the intersectionality is that's most important. So it might be black residents who are disproportionately black residents of cities who are funding the pensions of disproportionately black recipients. So that makes it a generational story or a sector, public private sector story. It might be city dwellers who are funding pensions for uh, retirees who then move to the suburbs and move to another state. So it may be an urban, non-urban story. Uh, Latinos are increasingly residents of cities, but they are not, uh, they are a very small segment of the relatively older public sector employees who are on the verge of retirement. So there's a, there's a redistribution from Latinos, young Latinos residents to older African-Americans and whites public sector employees and so on. So it's very unclear what the intersectionality here is in this case. Uh, the conclusion I wanna to come to is that intersectionality, intersectionality matters as a analytic tool for understanding what's going on in these cities and what the inequality looks like. And as a policy tool for thinking about how best to overcome the various problems that these policies suggest, but exactly how it matters for whom, why it has this particular impact, um, and what to do about it varies enormously via policy arena.
So I don't have any solutions, unlike my colleagues. I just have questions. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Kanisha Johnson. I am a fifth year PhD candidate in the Department of Government and I'm a fellow in the Inequality and Social Policy Programme. First, big thanks to the organisers. It's really great to have community during these really bizarre times. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about how we might reimagine the political power of incarcerated people in the United States. So prison and state punishment statistics are now pretty much seared into our memory. We know that the United States incarcerates the highest percent of any country's population. We also know that black and brown folks are more likely to be victim of the system. A really hot topic in social sciences and public policy and in wider public discussion is paying attention to the way in which the prison industrial complex um, restricts people from the political realm, which depending on the state of conviction, people are either temporarily, permanently or never restricted the right to vote. Daily, we are bombarded with headlines that tell us of people who are in the system or who have recently left the system have been left out of the voting um, system in our country. But I, when I started to look at this, and I remember the exact moment when I had this thought, and it was by, uh, shared by Veshla Weaver, and I know many students of hers are eternally indebted to her, and she was like, think bigger. So what if we were to reimagine what engagement looks like by those who are inside of prisons? And should we think about their political engagement as waiting until their sentences are completed and then turning out to vote? Or are there alternative ways that those who are pushed out attempt to push back in while they're under the supervision of the state? So this idea that people who are incarcerated engaging in politics is not a novel idea. It's been documented by scholars and people working in communities, work by Dan Berger, Victoria Law, Heather Ann Thompson, Ella Baker, Huey Newton, just to name a few have been paying attention to this. Um, Veshla Weaver, Miras and Gwen Prowse are looking at other ways that we can imagine policing in race class subjug subjugated communities. So I'm gonna spend my remaining time today talking about some snippets from my ongoing research surrounding the political lives of those who are incarcerated, specifically looking at the role of the prison press in the 1900s and the role of protests inside prisons in the last couple of decades. Um, so I want to show first that we should reframe our understanding of how people who are in incarcerated engage in politics. And second, I want to show that in some cases, these actions are really effective at eliciting policy changes. So the prison press began in the United States in the 1800s by a man called William Cateltus, and he wanted to bring attention to the terrible conditions in prison and wanted to end imprisonment for debt. And this press really ramped up in the 60s and 70s, and the images that you see on the screen right now are from the archives, and they are re two really great examples of how the press um, was instrumental in bringing about policy change. On the left, um, they're, so they're both from the Angolite, which is a well-known uh, newspaper from Angola prison in Louisiana. And on the left is one of a series of articles calling attention to the shackling practices that were injuring men. And this series of articles eventually led the Louisiana prison system banning this particular use of this practice. And then on the right, is another article from a series drawing attention to the exploitative nature of the cost of telephone calls from a company called Global Tellink. And the articles along with a number of telephone boycotts and complaints from family members um, push Global Tellink to drop their charging prices and then refunded families the excessive charges that they'd been paying over the past couple of years. Um, and then here are another few examples, as well as engaging in advocacy. The prison press also served as an information network. In the middle here, this was an article that was circulated around many newspapers and it informed incarcerated people of the various tactics that they could employ to bring about change. On the right, there are a number of what I saw in the archives, there are a number of instances where incarcerated people could draw attention to specific cases of injustice. Um, and then on the left, you see a petition from a Massachusetts prison being sent to, an, to the Illinois legislature to highlight the terrible conditions that were happening in Illinois. And this would not have been able to happen had it not been for this newspaper. So next I want to quickly segue. So from a working, from another working paper, I'm using data from the North Carolina Department of Public Safety and some various um, protest data from outside of prisons. 
Um, and so here the solid line represents the resistance rate or the, the number of active riots or work stoppages that happened inside North Carolina prisons. And then the dotted lines are protests that happened either within North Carolina, along the border, or some of the really big protests that people who are incarcerated would know about. And one of the first things that I noticed is that resistance inside prison in North Carolina is really, really common. So in the 12-ish hundred weeks that I have included in the data, upward of 1100 of those weeks had a recorded form of resistance. We also can see that there are some parallel trends between inside and outside protest. Um, and then I have some anecdotal evidence that incarcerated people have been successful in protesting overcrowding and the danger that COVID-19 poses with regard to this overcrowding. And I also don't think that this is a isolated to North Carolina in any sense. This image here shows a protest that happened in Cook County Jail in April of this year against the surge in COVID-19 cases where people who were incarcerated were trying to signal to the outside that conditions are terrible, we need your help. And I think that this, these examples, along with other people working in this area, just shows that we need to really rethink how we frame and understand political participation so that we can more widely understand the lives of those who are incarcerated. Thank you. I am um, Mike Norton. I'm going to attempt to do this. Let's see. Hopefully you can see my screen. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm a, a professor at the business school. I'm actually a social psychologist by training and then switched into marketing. And now I'm, um, I've been studying inequality for a few years. And I don't think this qualifies as a big idea, but the idea that we had uh, for studying inequality was um, basically just to ask people if they knew what was going on and then ask them what they would want to be going on and then compare those to what was actually going on. And then as another equally important goal to see if people agreed or disagreed on all of that. So you can imagine that people have preferences for inequality and they're so different as a function of age or income or political affiliation that it's an interesting social science exercise to measure them, but there's not a lot of consensus that we could think about, oh, I see people in general want to move this direction or that direction. So I'll just talk about two of the projects uh, that we've uh, done in this domain, which show similar uh, results, but also different in, I think, an important way, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. So um, the very first one, actually, that's not true. This is the second one uh, that we did uh, on income. We can uh, use data from this great, by the way, this is publicly available data if you are a nerd like me and want to look at inequality. So you can download its amazing data set, 40 countries, um, over 50,000 respondents. They ask, of course, a ton of questions, but two of the questions they ask are really great for what we wanted to study. They ask people in each of these countries, how much do you think a chairman of a large national corporation earns? And you enter it in your own local currency. And then they ask, how much do you think an unskilled worker in a factory earns? And you enter that in your local currency. They're trying to get at across all of the countries, the language for the highest paid and the lowest paid person, which varies from country to country. But that's kind of the idea of, of these two questions. We would have loved to ask a million other questions, of course, but this isn't, this isn't our data. So we have for all these countries, those two numbers. That is the, what do you think things are like right now? Then they also asked, and the, uh, that's my poor color change in italics uh, that's not in the actual survey they also ask same question what do you think they should earn uh, for both of these people as well and that's the um, kind of if it were up to you what do you think these two sets of people uh, actually should earn in some sort of prescriptive sense so um, you I believe all know what ratios are but to, just to orient you to the figure that's coming up what we do is because everything's in a different currency and it gets very confusing is we just create standard pay ratios for everybody. Uh, for example, you give us your estimate for CEO and you give us your estimate for unskilled worker and we just create a ratio of one number so that it will look standardized across all of the countries. And then to orient you to this figure, uh, you can see around the outside is all of the countries in the survey. Basically, people look for theirs immediately and they want to know how well they're doing. So you can do that. Um, this is uh, the way to interpret this is you can see the outer ring is 41. That would mean that people said, I think that the chairman makes 41 times as much uh, as the unskilled worker. 
And of course, in the center is one, that would be someone saying, I think that they make the exact same amount. So that's how to interpret uh, what I'll show you now. And here's what people think is going on. These are their estimates in all of these countries. And you can see that they vary pretty widely from country to country, what people think is going on. Um, these are, I'll show you in a sec, they're correlated with what's actually going on uh, across these countries. So there's some predictability to where the spikes are. But the um, overall thing that, that people think is something like 11 to 1 for the chairman versus the unskilled worker. You can think of it as like 200 in the US, roughly 200,000 to 20,000 is what they think is, is the actual um, ratio. But then, of course, they also asked, what, what is your ideal? And we can do that ratio as well. And you can see, and there's stats we can do, blah, 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 but you don't really need, you can just see that in every single country, you see that people's ideal ratio is um, more equal than their estimated ratio to something like five or six to one. So in the US, if it was 200,000 and 20,000, now it's like 150,000 and 30,000. So in general, in countries, they take from the rich and give to the poor, you could say. But importantly, no country is even close to saying everyone should make the same amount. So a ratio of five or six to one is, is much more equal than reality, but there's literally no country where people think there shouldn't be inequality. And I think that's important because it's not that we're saying, look, everybody wants things to be perfectly equal. It's not at all what we see. They just want them to be more equal than they think they are. And then of course we wanna compare it to the actual uh, so this will be um, not really fair because there's no possible way that any of us could really know the answers to these questions. So I'm not saying, can you believe people don't know the answer to this? Because I didn't either. It's just interesting, I think, to compare what they think it's like, what they want it to be like to what it's actually like. It's hard to get these data for most countries. Um, and in fact, the data that we can get very noisy and, and certainly treat it with a grain of salt. We're not sure if these are the actual, actual numbers. Turns out rich people are pretty good at hiding income. I don't know if anybody <laughs> has ever noticed that. So um, here's what we have for the actual. Uh, you'll notice first off that the outer ring, which used to be at 41 to one is now at 351 to one. And you'll see that the US is a huge outlier and the other countries um, fall a little bit underneath that. But now I'll just plot, and again, this isn't really fair, but just for illustration purposes, I'll plot what people thought it actually was in those countries. And it looks like that. And then I'll plot what people would like it to be if it were up to them, and it looks like that. So we're talking about huge, huge differences from the way things are to the way things people want them to be uh, and what they think it is. I think comparing red to gray is not really that fair to people, as I said, because it's very hard to know this information. I do think, though, it's very fair to compare red to blue because those are the same respondents using the same assumptions, giving us two very different answers about what they think things are like and what they should be like. So uh, we also see in this data set huge consensus across different groups. So not just across countries, but across political affiliation, across income, gender, uh, any, basically any demographic variable we use, we still see that people's ideals are more equal than their estimates, which are of course much more equal uh, than, than the actual. That's really important as I mentioned at the beginning because we can actually say that people in country X almost all of the groups in country X would like things to be more this direction uh, than, than that direction. So we did that with income and then um, a, a, another place we thought would be instructive would be to do it with healthcare. And we did it with a bunch of domains, but one of them is just life. So uh, for example, this is one, one thing that we did. We had some um, nice data from um, a, not a paper of ours on life expectancy. It turns out that when more, you can think about it when more life is created because people are living longer on average. Who, who gets the life is sort of the way to think about this project. Is it equally distributed among all people or do some people actually get more life than other people? This study showed that uh, across one cohort in the US over the last 20 years, uh, 3.2 months. So it's like everybody got 3.2 more months of life. And what we ask people is, what do you, how do you think that was distributed among, you can see in the figure, the poorest to the richest Americans. And then again, we can ask them, what do you think it should be like? Who should get more or less life? And I said it like that, because you're gonna, when you think about it that way, it's hard to say, it's a little easier to say, yeah, people can make more money than other people. We thought it might be a little harder to say, yeah, people can get more life than other people.
So here's what um, people tell us. So um, th the actual distribution is, is not our data, it's data from the world. And it looks like this. And if that's uh, horrifying to you, it should be because it actually shows that uh, in this particular cohort, poorer people got less life, they actually died younger than um, wealthy people. And you can see that wealthy people, the dark blue bar, got a lot of the life. This Now we can get to our data. So people's estimates are like this. So again, aware of the pattern for sure, just like they were in the income, but thinking that things are more equal than they are. These are not trivial differences in estimates. They're just smaller than the actual. But this is the one that we wanted to see because th this could look like income or it could look like this. And what we see here is that people have much, much less tolerance for inequality around health and life than they do around things like income and wealth. They still have some tolerance for it. And if you ask people, some people have beliefs that poorer people make bad decisions for themselves or something like that. And that's why they'll edge it a little bit like that. I don't agree with that, but that's, that's some people's logic for what's happening here. Um, I think what's so important is that um, framed like this, that it's not okay to have inequality, but we know obviously that income inequality and health inequality are deeply linked to each other. So it's not really okay for people to say, okay, nobody gets more life, but yes, some people get more income. And in fact, we do studies where we try to get people to think about both at the same time, and it's painful for people to do because they want to have income inequality a little bit, and they want to have um, the same health for everybody else. So, um, and as I said, these are across all sorts of samples that we've um, tested and all sorts of demographics. We even got samples from NPR let us do a survey on their website and Forbes let us do a survey on their website. Turns out NPR people want things to be more equal than Forbes people, but both groups massively want things to be more equal than they think they are, which is already more equal than they actually are. And then I'll end just after this. The last thing that we've been working on is um, what happens if then we show you this? So if you were about to vote on some policy or express some opinion or buy some product, what if right before that we said, boom, here's what things look like? Or we can say, hey, what do you think things look like? And then show you reality. Or we can say, hey, what would you like things to be like? And then show you reality. And the idea is that it'll give you an information shock. And we were thinking, wow, that might really change people's uh, opinions drastically. And uh, what happens is it changes them a tiny bit or not very much at all, is what I would say. So we thought we might have a, a really good like silver bullet for these problems, and we don't. Um, in a project with um, Ilyana Kuzienko and Emmanuel Saez and Stephanie Stancheva in economics um, at Harvard, we showed people, here's the actual state of things moves their opinions on minimum wage a tiny bit. It does move things on estate tax more when you see the extreme inequality, then people say maybe there should be an estate tax. But in general, the effects are pretty small. And in a project with my former student, Bavia Mohan, uh, we looked to see, does it change what consumers buy? So imagine you're gonna go buy a sweater and right before you buy it, you find out that that company has a crazy CEO to worker uh, wage gap. Does that influence in your, your purchasing? And we can show that it does actually change like which gift card you'll pay more for and things like that. But again, the effects aren't, you know, nobody buys it or everybody buys it. They're sort of um, on the margin. The latest thing we're looking at, and then I'll stop, is um, gender inequality um, as well. So we focused on um, health and wealth and income and things like that and looked at people's reactions. Now we're looking when we explain gender inequality to people. You can imagine very similar pattern. People have no idea of the magnitude of it. They would like it to be more equal than that. And when we show them, it can change their opinions um, about a bunch of things. So with that, I'll um, stop and turn it over to the next person. Thanks. My name is Rob Sampson. I'm a professor in the social sciences. My home department is in sociology. I have uh, research interests in crime and punishment, the life course, neighborhood effects, urban inequality. And what I'd like to talk about today, just for a little bit, is um, maybe a big question, I'm not sure about a big idea, um, or at least a big uh, challenge as I see it, and that is to grasp history and biography and the relations between the two within society. And for the sociologists out there paying attention, that's actually uh, what Wright Mills called the sociological imagination. And my specific focus is on the lives of American children, who by the lottery of when they were born grew up during different moments of transformations 
in crime and punishment in the last quarter century. And so that's what I'd like to uh, focus on and give you a, a little bit of a background, or at least some motivating facts. Let me see if uh, share screen here can work. Okay, so you've all seen something like this, so I won't spend much time on it. It was referred to earlier. The era of mass incarceration, uh, which started in about 1975 um, and increased quite dramatically. Uh, but violence also went up, actually started much earlier in about 1965, uh, while imprisonment was flat, reached a peak in about 1992 or so, where you see that white line. I'm really fo focused and interested in this last quarter century, because what you see is what many have called the great American crime decline. And yet, still increasing incarceration, plateauing, and then falling off. But if you look at the right part of the screen, basically what we see is an equilibrium of high crime relative to 1960s, let's say, and high incarceration. What you're probably less familiar with is variations across the life course of individuals. I'll tell you more about this, but this is from a longitudinal study of children in Chicago born in 1980. And what I would argue here is that if we really wanna understand criminal justice inequality, number one, we have to start with arrest. You can't be incarcerated without being convicted and you can't be convicted without being arrested. And as you can see, it's sharply increasing during adolescence, re reaching a peak around 18 or 20, and then declining. The mean age of first incarceration is approximately around age 25, not just in my study, but nationally. And that's really coming down after the peak in the late teens and early 20s. So the life course of arrest is fundamental to understanding inequality and criminal justice, but so is studying age, crime, and social change. And that's been a real dilemma in the research literature. There's very few studies that try to put together macro social change of the sort shown in the first slide and the individual life course. That's what I'm trying to do. And thinking of this as the birth lottery of history studying criminalization in the lives of multiple cohorts coming of age. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly describe a few findings. It's based on a, a paper uh, with Roland Neal and also a book in progress, um, 2022, that's aspirational. Uh, I don't know about others, but it always takes me longer to finish a book, um, but hopefully it will be done by then. It's based on a multiple birth cohort design, the project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods. It's a project I've been involved with and directed since 1995 when it started. And what you can see here is you can start to put substantive changes with particular years, going back actually to the urban crisis, the rise of incarceration and crime, the peak of violence, the start of the crime decline, and then this interesting era of high incarceration, aggressive policing, but yet lower crime. Fortuitously, we didn't really know what was going to happen in 1995, but we started with multiple cohorts, including an infant cohort. We enrolled mothers who were pregnant or enrolled infants um, within six months in 1995, just literally when violence was starting to plummet in the city of Chicago. We also enrolled nine-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds. So for example, the 15-year-olds is from the previous figure I just showed you, were born in 1980. Young children during the crack era, uh, grew up during the height of peak of violence, yet we're transitioning into adulthood during the post-1995 period. So what does this look like? Well, one of the things I'm doing is to try to reveal the power of history. And this is from the paper that Roland and I are, um, have forthcoming. And on the left, you can see, again, the age arrest curve by different cohorts. Now, what I've done here, which you can do in a multiple, multiple cohort design, is put years in terms of when it's being observed, but this is also, we can extract at the same age, what is the probability of being arrested? And what you can see is there's a tremendous difference between, for example, the younger cohort, the blue dashed line and the red line, over 100% difference in the probability of being arrested. But why? You may have heard there's lots of counter hypothesis for cohort differences. It could be different composition of poverty, immigrant status, or single parent families or parental incarceration certainly varies over time. Exposure to lead is a big hypothesis out there about the crime decline. We've even heard in the presidential debates about so-called super predators. 
low self-control. The idea that the composition of early cohorts was made up of kids that were, were different in propensities to crime, in other words. So if the cohort composition shifts, you can see a change, but it's in, in that sense, it's not really social change, it's more compositional change. So we can look at this um, under various assumptions. I'm not gonna get into the details here, but under the assumption that we can adjust for compositional differences between cohort, we can look at age period interactions. And the difference between these curves, we would argue, is in a sense, the effect of history. Still a huge difference in the probability of being arrested on the order of about 100%. And the age at which you desist, and remember, incarceration isn't happening on average until age 25. There's about an eight year gap between the younger cohort and the older cohort in terms of when they reach that uh, period of, of desistance in the early 20s. Furthermore, I'm not saying that individual characteristics don't matter. We can also look at how individual characteristics such as disadvantage, race and, race and ethnicity, and uh, even self-control interact with history. These are the truly disadvantaged, if you will, um, on the left, I'm not going to get into the definition, poor using um, standard indicators of disadvantage. You can still see the same age crime curve, but you see it moderated to the extent that for the younger cohorts, the disadvantaged, the probability of being arrested is not that different than it is um, in for the advantaged. In other words, there's been a weakening of the relationship between socioeconomic disadvantage and arrest over time. You can see this even more closely when you look at the simple cumulative arrest inequality over time. Just to orient you to this figure, um, what you're looking at now are the cohorts, the older cohorts and the younger cohorts, one born in 1985, the red is 1995. You can't really see the disadvantage advantage differences because there's such a weak relationship between disadvantage and arrest for the younger cohorts. And it's similar to the older cohorts. However, when you look at the disadvantaged from the older cohorts, it's a phenomenal difference. 80%, actually over 80%, of the disadvantaged older cohorts were arrested compared to 40%. That's obviously a huge difference. And this is not compositional. This is an historical shift in the relationship between socioeconomic disadvantage and arrest. And African-Americans are predominantly um, driving this. Um, I don't have time to show you the race ethnic um, curves, but they look uh, fairly similar. We often hear that self-control or what's popularly known as grit matters a lot. And we can look at it because of the unique nature of the design. And yes, self-control is related to arrest, as you can see in the left. High self-control individuals have lower crime than um, the low self-control individuals. So those theorists are right in one sense, but look at differently. The social changes are so profound that the high self-control kids of the older generation were rendered essentially equivalent to the low self-control kids of the younger generation. So what that means is individual propensities are fundamentally tied into social change. And so I think, and, and I'll, I'll conclude here just with a few thoughts, that it's not just the traditional risk factors such as self-control, family background, neighborhood, even things that I study. It's not just that they don't account for these cohort differences. In fact, social change dominates. And I think that in a, in a real sense, these individual differences in particular aren't really individual at all. Furthermore, their influence shifts. It's historically contingent or it's an interactive outcome. Other work we're looking at is disentangling what macro level changes, because I've, I've talked about age, crime, and the life course with respect to comparing across these cohorts. At the macro level, changes in policing of disorders, societal declines in criminal behavior, 
drug war, things we know a little bit more about. Um, we've parsed out like what percentage is due to each. And it's about 50-50 in terms of policing uh, changes and societal declines in criminal behavior. Um, you can see here, for example, the violence arrests and uh, property arrests are going down, even disorder arrests, sort of the contradictions of mass incarceration. Uh, the change in arrests from 1995 to 2016, for example, in disorder, were plummeting in Chicago. The number of officers were the same. In violence and property, were declining both in arrests and in violence. I'll conclude by saying, you know, what does this all mean? I think there's multiple implications, but I think one of the the main things is that it really calls into question the risk factor paradigm, which is dominant. Uh, the First Step Act of criminal justice reform actually calls for more risk assessment, but the actual risk factors are fundamentally um, tied into the confounding of age and uh, historical change. And I also think, and this is something I'm currently uh, writing about that's more uh, normative and philosophical in nature has to do with redressing cohort injustices, right? Because if we can show that the birth lottery history has induced these kinds of changes, and it calls for a rethinking, not just of our prediction paradigms going forward, but for cohort injustices of those who grew up in these conditions looking backwards. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rob. Thanks to all the presenters for a wonderful set of big ideas. And now uh, let's open it up for questions. If you guys can just raise your hands in the, partic I'll, in the participant window, I'll, I'll call on folks. Um, as was a tradition started by the late and great Diva Pager, I'm going to let the first question be asked by a student. I have a question for you, David. Um, how did you decide to use the success metric that we see in your access versus success graph? And is it correlated with other similar metrics that we might think of? Or for example, moving from like the bottom 40% to, you know, the top 40% or something like this? Yeah, great question. So, so that is, um, it's not my metric, that's the Chetty and company metric. Um, it's a binary indicator for whether you end up in the top 20% of the income distribution. I, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they used it because it's easy to understand. But it turns out if you look at, you know, top half or top 40%, or just to look at a more continuous way at income, you would get a pretty similar answer. The one place where things look quite a bit different is if you look at like top tail outcomes, like the probability of ending up in the top 1% of income, for example, those things are quite skewed toward a small number of colleges. With that exception, I think the top 20% indicator does a pretty good job of telling the story. Emma. I'm curious about the sort of general equilibrium effects of sending everybody to college. So like what's gonna happen to the wage premium for college if everyone's going to college and how do you think about um, sort of vocational jobs and other jobs where a college degree doesn't have sort of a clear relationship to productivity? Yeah, thanks for the question, Emma. I promise these one, I'll, I won't take questions just for my own talk, but um, so I think, so, you know, we know what would happen is that if you increase the share of people who got a college degree, the, the college premium, the return to having a college degree, the difference in earnings between people who have a degree and those who don't would go down. So college would cease to pay off quite as much. To which I say, that is exactly the point. Um, that's how you reduce inequality. But I don't think that mean. I think that doesn't mean that living standards for people would necessarily decline. Because if you look over time, you know, what a middle class income buys you today is so much greater than what it was a generation ago. And so I think there's a sense in which when you compare distributions of earnings, you're always comparing people in one part of the distribution to people in another, it's all relative. But in an absolute sense, having a more educated workforce leads to more productivity and more prosperity for everybody. And I think that's what you see in the history of this country, you know, from a, a from a point, you know, maybe 50 years ago where high school was close to universal, but very few people were going to college to today, you see that, you know, think about the minimum knowledge standard it requires to be a productive member of the workforce has really gone up a lot. But what that means is we're, we're producing more um, for people to enjoy. People have, on average, more comfortable lives than they did 100 years ago, 50 years ago, people are living longer. And so I think that's, that's the overall end game is to make things both more unequal and, sorry, less unequal and better for everyone. I do, Andres. Your question is about 
scholarships and basically the cost of college for some groups. I think that's a first order issue and there are a variety of ways to solve it. I think one way to solve it is to make college, to lower the tuition price of college, right? And that's something that I was talking, I think we should do in some sense. There's another model, which is I would call the Australian model, which is to make income contingent financing or income contingent loans available to all students as a default and to have the government give out those loans in a way that um, it's a sliding scale on in income. So if you earn more after you graduate, you pay a larger share of your loan. Your loan balance isn't a fixed number. It's actually a percentage of your income over some period of time. That's a financing mechanism that basically redistributes ex post rather than ex ante. So rather than saying like pay up front and if you can afford it, great. And if you can't borrow a bunch of money, we say, look, if you happen to experience a lot of economic success after you graduate, you're gonna pay more than if you don't. That creates other issues, but I think in Australia, they've been very successful with that model. And I, I would love to see some kind of income, income contingent financing in the US of, um, of a you know, push toward greater um, completion of college. All right, somebody asked a question that's not about my, my talk. Can you hold it and let's ask, let's let David Elwood ask a question. I just feel bad. I, there's too much inequality in, in questions right now. It's right now. Go ahead, David. I'll ask a question sort of jointly of, uh, of uh, Kanisha and, and uh, our good friend, Mr. Sampson, um, which is, um, I am struck, first of all, I really found both quite compelling. And of course they interrelate. I mean, uh, Rob, I, you know, the, the evidence seemed extremely compelling that there really was a fundamental change. I loved your comment. It wasn't who you are, it was when you were. Um, and, um, and then the, the political power of those in prison, uh, I thought was a, a wonderful thing to think about. First for Kanisha, um, when people leave prison, um, there's another important set of questions about their political power. One is their voting issue, which is more widely studied, but more, more broadly, the extent to which they're willing or able to engage in activities that, that might help deal with the Rob sort of things. And for Rob, I would just simply say, um, uh, you know, we've, we've seen a lot going on, obviously, with Black Lives Matter and so forth. Um, have you thought about how what you found also can translate into political powers and so forth? Um, uh, because of course, what's going on here is is some conscious and, and, and what drove this as well. So uh, just big questions, but both in red. The question really is uh, not just about political power when people are in prison, but when they leave, how does the prison experience in some sense affect their capacity and willingness to engage and again, I don't mean voting, I mean in the larger kind of organizational sorts of strategies um, and papers and so forth that you mentioned. Do you have any sense of where, whether this activity in prison, which has some impact obviously, but again, you think prison would be the ultimate strategy to get people not to be engaged and participate and, and uh, feel political. Yeah, so I think to answer that, I'll just pull off of some people who have done some work in the past. Angela Davis has written a lot about this, and she views the prison as being this mobilizing force, so it radicalizes you. So in one instance, prison can be a mobilizer. Um, in other instances, we have, um, Hannah Walker has written extensively on this, the way that not direct um, experiences with the prison system, but indirect experience. So if your family member has been affected, then you are more likely through that feeling of injustice to get involved in a migrate, like in a, in a million different ways. Um, also what we've learned from Vashla Weaver and her co-authors is that a lot of people just want to opt out of the electoral system in this formal system because it's just not working for them. So they would instead refer to retreat from this formal one and then in the short term build community and institutions within their community. Um, so I think that like those lines are, are, are how I'm thinking through this of people just lose a lot of trust once you've experienced a huge amount of injustice through the system, then you're going to start um, reinvesting and building institutions that will will offer a form of protection that the wider societal government has not offered you. Great. Thank you. Well, yeah, um, David. Um, oh, oh, yeah, just really quickly. I mean, I think that's a great question. And um, I really enjoyed Kanisha's presentation because I do think there's a connection. Yes, I thought about it um, still in progress, though. But I think social movements deriving from these sorts of ideas um, make a lot of sense. And, and what I would say is it's not just about uh, political power in prison, although that's important, 
one has to remember that these cohorts and that, that transformation affected m multiple lives, right? So in other words, the kids, many of the kids that were arrested, that 80%, yes, they went to pre prison, but their sisters and brothers and parents and others also were affected by those changes. And I think um, that is part of the, the power of social change. I mean, maybe it's not an accident that the founders of Black Lives Matter, um, three women uh, were all born between 1980 and 83, are the very cohorts that um, I was looking at that, that were most um, affected. So I think that it's not, it's, it's also witnessing and experiencing through the um, criminalization of others that, that matters too, that builds a, a broad reach, right? Because the number of people that have, have a friend or a family member that have been arrested is huge. And so I think that in addressing cohort injustices, we have to mobilize those people. And that, that is something that uh, I'm currently thinking Thanks everybody, we're out of time, but thanks everybody for attending. I thought this was a terrific session. Uh, come back next week when Will Doby will be moderating. We'll have spe um, big idea talks from Heather Boucher, Lucas Chancel, Nathan Hendren, Felix Owusu, and Anna Stansbury. So another all-star lineup. I hope you guys will join us next week. Thanks so much, everybody. Great to see you all. <laughs>